Amelia Earhart, in full Amelia Mary Earhart, born July 24, 1897, Atchison, Kansas, U.S. disappeared July 2, 1937, near Howland Island, Central Pacific Ocean, American aviator, one of the world's most celebrated, who was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Her disappearance during a flight around the world in 1937 became an enduring mystery, fueling much speculation. Earhart's father was a railroad lawyer, and her mother came from an affluent family. While still a child, Earhart displayed an adventurous and independent nature for which she would later become known. After the death of her grandparents, the family struggled financially amid her father's alcoholism. The Earharts moved often, and she completed high school in Chicago in 1916. After her mother received her inheritance, Earhart was able to attend the Ogont School in Rydal, Pennsylvania. However, during a visit to her sister in Canada, Amelia developed an interest in caring for soldiers wounded in World War I. In 1918 she left junior college to become a nurse's aide in Toronto. After the war, Earhart entered the pre-med program at Columbia University in New York City but left in 1920 after her parents insisted that she live with them in California. There she went on her first airplane ride in 1920, an experience that prompted her to take flying lessons. In 1921 she bought her first plane, a Kinner Esther, and two years later she earned her pilot's license. During this time promoters sought to have a woman fly across the Atlantic Ocean, and in April 1928 Earhart was selected for the flight. Some speculated that the decision was partly based on her resemblance to Charles Lindbergh, who had become the first man to fly non-stop solo across the Atlantic the previous year. On June 17, 1928, Earhart departed Trepassey, Newfoundland, Canada, as a passenger aboard a seaplane piloted by Wilma Stoltz and Louis Gordon. After landing at Bury Port, Wales, on June 18, Earhart became an international celebrity. She wrote about the flight in 20 hours, 40 minutes, 1928, and undertook a lecture tour across the United States. Much of the publicity was handled by publisher George Palmer Putnam, who had helped organize the historic flight. The couple married in 1931, but Earhart continued her career under her maiden name. That year she also piloted an autogyro to a record-setting altitude of 18,415 feet 5,613 meters. Determined to justify the renown that her 1928 crossing had brought her, Earhart crossed the Atlantic alone on May 20 to 21, 1932. Her flight in her Lockheed Vega from Harbour Grace, Newfoundland, to Londonderry, Northern Ireland, was completed in a record time of 14 hours 56 minutes despite a number of problems. She notably experienced mechanical difficulties and inclement weather and was unable to land in her scheduled destination of Paris. Afterward she published The Fun of It, 1932, in which she wrote about her life and interest in flying. Earhart then undertook a series of flights across the United States. In addition to her piloting feats, Earhart was known for encouraging women to reject constrictive social norms and to pursue various opportunities, especially in the field of aviation. In 1929 she helped found an organization of female pilots that later became known as the 99s. Earhart served as its first president. In addition, she debuted a functional clothing line in 1933, which was designed for the woman who lives actively. In 1935 Earhart made history with the first solo flight from Hawaii to California, a hazardous route 2,408 miles, 3,875 kilometers, long, a longer distance than that from the United States to Europe. She departed from Honolulu on January 11 and, after 17 hours and 7 minutes, landed in Oakland the following day. Later that year she became the first person to fly solo from Los Angeles to Mexico City. In 1937 Earhart set out to fly around the world, with Fred Noonan as her navigator, in a twin-engine Lockheed Electra. On June 1 the duo began their 29,000-mile journey, departing from Miami and heading east. Over the following weeks they made various refueling stops before reaching Leigh, New Guinea, on June 29th. 
At that point, Earhart and Noonan had traveled some 22,000 miles, 35,000 kilometers. They departed on July 2nd, headed for Howland Island, approximately 2,600 miles, 4,200 kilometers, away. The flight was expected to be arduous, especially since the tiny coral atoll was difficult to locate. To help with navigation, two brightly lit U.S. ships were stationed to mark the route. Earhart was also in intermittent radio contact with the Itasca, a U.S. Coast Guard cutter near Howland. Late in the journey, Earhart radioed that the plane was running out of fuel. About an hour later she announced, we are running north and south. That was the last transmission received by the Itasca. The plane was believed to have gone down some 100 miles, 160 kilometers, from the island, and an extensive search was undertaken to find Earhart and Noonan. However, on July 19, 1937, the operation was called off, and the pair was declared lost at sea. Throughout the trip, Earhart had sent her husband various materials, including letter and diary entries, and these were published in Last Flight, 1937. A popular and relatively straightforward theory is that the plane crashed into the sea when it ran out of fuel and then sank. Both Earhart and Noonan were either instantly killed upon impact or were unable to get out and drowned, the theory goes. It's generally agreed that the wreckage lies beneath the waves near the planned destination Howland Island or another island around 350 miles southeast called Nikumaoro. Experts recently detected code on an aluminium panel that was found washed up on Nikumaoro in 1991, which could be part of Earhart's missing plane. It's possible that Earhart diverted the plane towards Nikumaoro when she couldn't find Howland Island prior to crashing. Another theory suggests the duo made a landing near the coral reef around Nikumaoro and were able to transmit radio signals. According to the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, Tyre, Earhart used the aircraft's radio to send multiple distress calls. In the week after the plane vanished, there were 120 reports from around the world claiming to have picked up messages from her. One of her transmissions said the plane was part on land, part in water, possibly on a reef at the mercy of the tides. Navigator Noonan was seriously injured and needed immediate medical attention, the transmission allegedly said. However, no plane was seen by Navy pilots surveying the island several days after her disappearance, suggesting the plane may have been pushed off the reef into deeper water. One of the more gruesome theories concerns the coconut crab, Burgus latro, a massive carnivorous species of terrestrial hermit crab. These carnivorous beasts weigh up to 9 pounds, 4 kilograms, with a body length of 16 inches, and have large claws with which to crack open coconuts. They are found on multiple Pacific islands in the area where Earhart and Noonan are thought to have disappeared, including Nikumaoro. The theory goes that the duo were able to land the plane on Nikumaoro but were ultimately eaten by the crabs, known for being the world's largest land invertebrate. In 1940, three years after the plane disappeared, British colonial officer Gerard Gallagher discovered parts of a skeleton on Nikumaoro. Richard Jantz, a professor on skeletal biology at the University of Tennessee who analyzed the skeleton, has said it's almost 100% certain the remains are hers. Analysis reveals that Earhart is more similar to the Nikumaoro bones than 99% of individuals in a large reference sample, he said in his 2018 study. This strongly supports the conclusion that the Nikumaoro bones belonged to Amelia Earhart. Not all the bones to make up an entire skeleton were found, but a 2014 study suggests the crabs dragged some of them back to their burrows. Coconut crabs are known to eat birds, rodents, other crabs and carrion, but are not particularly vicious hunters and are don't have a taste for humans. If the crabs were in any way involved with the story, it seems most likely they ate the remains after Earhart and Noonan perished on the island. Possible evidence that the aviators briefly lived on Nikumaoro has been found, including a shoe, ointment bottle and a sextant, an instrument used for navigation. Most theories maintain that she died nearby or on Nikumaoro Island, but this fourth theory puts her final days on Saipan, an island northwest of Nikumaoro. Saipan is now a Commonwealth of the United States, 
but in 1937 it was under Japanese control. The theory suggests that Earhart and Noonan had been found by Japanese pilots on an island further south before being brought to Saipan and executed. It's partly based on recollections by a man called Tana Kinto who worked at the Saipan prison camp. Tana Kinto recalled two white Americans, one woman and one man, being brought to the camp sometime in the 1930s, he told his nephew years later. The nephew, Bill Sablan, said in 2017, so apparently I think they were both killed in Saipan and buried there. I found out later on as I made my inquiries that, after the war was over, their bodies were exhumed by an American military branch and shipped back to the United States. Now where those bodies are now is somebody's own question to answer, nobody seems to know. And right now America's still looking for Amelia Earhart. The prison camp theory actually dates back much further to the 1960s, when CBS radio reporter Fred Gorner interviewed several witnesses who said that two white flyers or spies had been picked up on the island before the Second World War. They claimed that one of them was a tall white woman was dressed like a man, with her hair cut short. Meanwhile, an old photo purported to show Earhart, Noonan and their plane in Saipan, although it was later ruled to be taken at least three years after the crash. According to American author W.C. Jameson, Earhart's plane was fitted with special cameras to take pictures of Japanese military installations on Pacific Islands. She was captured, but subsequently freed in 1945 before taking on the identity of another woman, Jameson alleges in Amelia Earhart, Beyond the Grave.